Stanford University. All right, well, uh, thanks so much for that generous introduction. Um, and welcome, all of you, back to Stanford. Uh, it's so good to have you all back. Uh, I hope that you're enjoying the reunion homecoming. Um, I, I got that right, right? It's reunion homecoming. This is what we got, not, okay, okay, not reunion weekend. Um, so uh, so a, as, as I was introduced, I'm a social psychologist here at Stanford. And um, when I was thinking about what talk I should give today, uh, what would be an interesting topic uh, to talk with you all about, uh, I thought about a bunch of different stuff that I teach on and do research on, um, but then I was trying to think from your perspective of like, you know, what would be an interesting thing uh, to hear a professor talk about, and, and I thought about this, um, the pursuit of a meaningful life, the pursuit of purpose in life, um, and, and also we'll be talking some about uh, the pursuit of happiness. And um, a first proviso I should offer at the beginning of this lecture is that uh, the last time that I gave this lecture uh, was... Uh, Strangely, at a bar in San Francisco, um, there was a speaker series called Raising the Bar in San Francisco, and I, I was, which, which I took part in. And uh, I can see this will be a somewhat different experience. Uh, only about two-thirds of you are drinking right now, because uh, they were all drinking at the bar. Um, a second proviso uh, before I, I jump in here is that uh, I should offer up front that research in this area on meaning in life and happiness is, is really very nascent. You know, it's a new emerging area. This area of research on happiness is about maybe 15 years old. Research, systematic research on meaning in life is it, maybe, it's, a, it's an even smaller thread within that literature. And so, uh, you know, a lot of these questions are uh, unanswered, and a lot of the answers that we think we do have are sort of tentative, and, uh, you know, so take it with a grain of salt. And we think about, like, why is it that research in these areas has sort of struggled to take off? I think one of the reasons is the very personal nature of finding meaning in life. Um, and so the answers for you might overlap with other people in America or in the world, um, but you're, they're gonna be personal as well. So I mean, you're, the answer for you to this question uh, is gonna be your own to a certain extent. And, um, and that may be part of why it's hard to do research in this area. Um, but nonetheless, I think that the work that's been done here that I'll be communicating to you today uh, does hopefully have some interesting uh, lessons to offer. Um, so, uh, so while there are areas that, uh, that I know better than this one that I could give a maybe you know, higher confidence uh, lecture on, uh, I can't think of that many lectures I could give you that would be more important. So, uh, so in here we'll know less about what we're talking about, uh, but what we're talking about will be more important than, for example, team building and nonprofit organizations. Also important, something I do research on and would say is very important, um, and know more about, but I think this is, this is probably more important for most people. Uh, so the title of my talk is Finding Meaning in an Unjust World. And uh, you know, let's, let's talk a little bit about what it is that we pursue when we pursue a meaningful life. What, what, what are we looking for? And uh, you know, different people are looking for different things. Um, so when you pursue a meaningful life, when you pursue purpose in your life, you might be looking for happiness. Um, you might be looking for authenticity. You might search for knowledge wealth, love, family. I actually forgot how long this list goes, so we'll just see. Uh, spirituality, um, justice. And if you're like me, uh, you look at this list, and, and maybe one thing you notice is that at different parts of your life, you are more concerned with different you know, items on this list. So I think back to when I was like a teenager in my early 20s, I think I was concerned with the pursuit of hedonic happiness. Uh, I, was, I was sort of strangely fixated with the pursuit of authenticity, you know? I was like, really wanted to be myself authentically for the world, very kind of teenager-y obsession. Um, I really don't care about that as much now. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm a total phony now, just like Holden Caulfield would say. Uh, and uh, you know, I, wanted, I wanted knowledge, you know, I always wanted that, but I don't think I valued family as much as I do now. I don't think I, I spend as much of my energy as like pursuing justice as maybe I do now. Um, you know, and now, now it's, th those are central concerns for me. You know, family is more important, justice is, is more important, um, spirituality has become you know, somewhat important to me. Um, and whatever it is on this list that maybe you relate to as, as, this, as consuming you in your pursuit, um, one thing you might notice is that it's, it's hard to get. You know, like every one of these things is hard to get. 
Um, so, for example, you know, happiness. Happiness is hard to get, right? You know, like there's this whole area of research, some of which we're going to cover today, on how it is you can find happiness. In fact, my former colleague, I used to teach, don't hold this against me, alumni, I used to teach at UC Berkeley for seven years. And when I was a professor there, uh, one of my close colleagues, Iris Mouse, does all this fantastic research on the pursuit of happiness and actually finds that it's exactly those people who spend more time concerned with pursuing happiness that find themselves less happy. Um, which is a sort of bitter irony and, uh, and might be what Nathaniel Hawthorne was thinking of when he, when he offered us this quote, happiness is at, as a butterfly, which when pursued is always beyond our grasp, but which, if you will sit down quietly, may alight upon you. Um, you know, I, I look at this quote, a, a couple things occur to me. Uh, on the one hand, it occurs to me Nathaniel Hawthorne was not just the sort of drab 19th century Christian scold, you know, uh, that we, we know from the Scarlet Letter, uh, the author of the Scarlet Letter. But also, secondly, Nathaniel Hawthorne was way hotter than I realized uh, in my <laughs> high school English class. I was completely unaware of that, um, but now we all are. Slight digression. Um, we also pursue beauty, aesthetic beauty. That's another thing people pursue. This reminds me of this uh, quote, the first lines of Arthur Rimbaud's A Season in Hell. Uh, Once, if I remember well, my life was a feast where all hearts opened and all wines flowed. One evening, I seated beauty on my knees, and I found her bitter, and I cursed her. And so we might pursue something that once we find it, we find disappointing, or we, we turn and turn fickle towards. And so the pursuit of these paths to meaning can be challenged by that, by our own reactions to them. Another thing that we might pursue, I told you I was very interested in pursuing when I was a teenager, you know, is authenticity, right? And this seems really simple, right? You just figure out who you are and then go be that person. Just perform yourself out in the world. How could that, how could that be hard? Um, but it is. It is hard. Um, anybody who's ever been 16 will tell you it's hard. Uh, and Herman Hesse, in his, his great novel, Damien, which tells us about sampling from different schools of thought to try to find the right way to pursue meaning, he, has, he opens the book with this line, I wanted only to try to live in accord with the promptings which came from my true self. Why was that so very difficult? Why indeed? So we also might pursue love. Uh, it's another thing you might pursue, and here I'm, I'm struck by this great old Woody Allen quote, uh, to love is to suffer, to avoid suffering one must not love, but then one suffers from not loving. <laughs> Therefore to love is to suffer, not to love is to suffer, to suffer is to suffer, to, to be happy is to love, to be happy then is to suffer, but suffering makes one unhappy. Therefore to be unhappy one must love, or love to suffer, or suffer from too much happiness. I hope you're getting all this down. Okay. <laughs> So when we think about the barriers that we face in pursuing these sorts of things, these different paths to meaning, uh, uh, there, uh, there are a lot of obstacles. There's a lot of stuff that stands between us and our, and our pursuit. Um, and I think there's a lot of ways in which our pursuit is, is, is thwarted by very real obstacles. And uh, as you can see from the title of this talk, uh, I think that a large swath of those obstacles uh, are associated with the unjust nature of the world. I think there are strong tensions between the pursuit of happiness uh, and satisfaction and meaning for oneself on the one hand, and then the recognition of suffering and injustice in the world. And if you came to this talk, you probably saw something in that title that struck you as at tension as well, some way in which this seemed to be a paradox. Um, so what are those tensions? Let's try to be systematic about, about our thinking here. Well, I think there's a bunch. There's a bunch of ways in which the pursuit of meaning, uh, please help yourself. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the pursuit of meaning and uh, the unjust nature of the world uh, might present tensions or, uh, or be somehow at odds. So, so uh, here's one tension. So uh, should I be happy? Should I pursue meaning in life? Should I be satisfied given that the world is unjust, that people are suffering, that people have it much worse off? Um, here you might think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and so there's some people working on the most basic needs, shelter and food and so on, and you're up here, and you, you can provide for those basic needs, uh, and you're interested in you know, some sort of higher order enlightenment or uh, meaning or purpose in life. Is that even okay? Um, also, can you, you know, even if you were to get over this question of should I be righteous enough to pursue some higher order goals when other people are at lower order positions, uh, can you? do it? You know, can you be happy given that other people in the world are suffering? Um, and a lot of people are really haunted by this. 
Uh, and then this is you know, a practical question of where should you put your time and attention? You know, should you be spending your time investing in the project of the self or the project of the world? You know, how much time uh, is it right to allocate to one thing versus the other? Um, and so these, these are big tensions, and we're going to try and chew on them here uh, for a little bit in this talk. Um, so let's drill down on these tensions and try to understand just how bad they are. And to do this, I'm going to start by giving you a quick overview of the field of positive psychology. And this is an area of psychology that studies uh, the, the causes of, or the sources of happiness, life satisfaction, and, and meaning in life. Uh, and then we'll return to the unjust nature of the world. Uh, and in the end, I'll try to leave you with some final thoughts. Um, so what are some of the causes of happiness? Uh, this area focuses a little more on happiness than meaning in life, so we'll be mixing these two up a bit. Um, uh, first, it might make sense. Well, if we were to follow this literature, funny thing about positive psychology, they profess to be studying the sources of happiness, but when you read positive psychology, they overwhelmingly tell you about the things that don't make you happy. Uh, and you're like, you know one thing that doesn't make me happy? Reading about what doesn't make me happy, but uh, yeah. Um, uh, but nonetheless, in the interest of being true to this literature, we'll cover some things, because we can learn some lessons here, I think. So, uh, so what doesn't make people happy? We'll get this out of the way and we'll be more positive. Um, uh, easily the whipping boy of positive psychologists is, is wealth and income. There's this idea that, uh, that an over-focus on pursuing wealth, pursuing higher income, uh, you may do this in pursuit of happiness, but, it, but it, you know, your efforts will be foiled by the world. And in particular, there's a really interesting systematic study done of this, which shows that in the US, beyond $75,000 a year or so, which to be clear is an upper middle class income in America, like America median household income, the median American makes about you know, 50 or so. So this is, this is a, a healthy income in America. Um, but most people believe that pursuing income in a household, in an average you know, cost of living place in America, uh, beyond this level will bring happiness. But systematic research on this finds that for most people that's not the case that uh, you know, more happiness can be had as you sort of are satisfying your basic needs, freedom from want, and uh, having basic shelter and necessities uh, provided for brings you more happiness. Lacking them, being in poverty, brings you unhappiness. But around this level, things start to flatten out, and that uh, those gains don't make you much happier. One of the reasons may be that as people pass that level of income, they start assessing how they're doing relative to other people, the pursuit of status, social status. And uh, research on this is especially negative. So the pursuit of just raw status, um, trying to succeed relative to others, uh, does not tend to make people happy. And there's a variety of reasons why this is. Um, one of them is that your orientation towards other people is competitive rather than cohesive. You know, instead of looking around at people and thinking about how you can connect with them, how you can build relationships that might make you happy, bring you meaning. Uh, you're instead thinking about how, you know, how to top them in some relative hierarchy. Uh, and uh, as you might guess, that undermines happiness. But it's easy to slip into, right? It's really easy to slip into, in America, just the sort of raw pursuit of status and income. You know, you get that lesson a lot. Uh, possessions. So there's a, a great deal of research that says, I mean, again, having your basic shelter provided for is important, but uh, if you are middle class in America, um, people tend to report that uh, spending money on possessions is going to be a great way to make themselves happier. You know, um, you know buy that 60-inch TV. I, I did. I, you know, I'm not, not bashing that entirely. But it's better to spend that same money on experiences. Uh, and so when they do research on this, one thing they find is that people tend to fall into this fallacy of like, oh, you know, I've got a thousand spare dollars, I'm going to spend it, or two thousand spare, whatever it is, I'm going to spend it on some possessions. And one of the reasons they think this will bring them so much happiness is, you know, they're tangible objects. They seem like they're going to endure. But as it turns out, they, maybe the key reason why investing that same money in experiences brings you more happiness is because, as it, as it turns out, experiences endure much more because you can take them with you. You can take them with you all the way to the end. And the possessions, you know, they expire. There's no, you know. Um, trying to think of a possession that wouldn't expire, and I, I can't. Um, but you can have those experiences. Uh, also, again, the pursuit of experiences brings you together with others. You know, if you experience things with other people, you go on a vacation with your husband or wife or with your family, that's something you share in with other people, pulls you into relationships. So you can see me fore, foreshadowing one of the big themes of what does make you happy. 
rumination and excessive self-focus. This is, this is not good, as it turns out. It sounds great. It sounds like a you know, barrel of monkeys. It turns out it's not. Um, uh, these things tend to make you unhappy. And so for a picture of like the unhappiest person in the world, according to positive psychology, uh, well, what movie do these images come from? Does anybody know? Yes, it's Citizen Kane. Orson Welles is Citizen Kane. Everybody's right. Uh, and uh, Citizen Kane, the, this character of Charles Foster Kane, who's you know, supposed to be a proxy for William Randolph Hearst, is almost like the model of how to, how to do it wrong, you know, according to positive psychologists. So uh, this guy is trying to you know, fill up something in himself that comes from a traumatized childhood. He's trying to fill it up in, in what he takes to be the sort of classically American way of you know, like status, income, possessions, you know, a mansion in California, you know, filled with all of the trophies of, you know, of his experiences in, in Europe. In fact, he goes to Europe purely to get possessions, right? Like even when he uh, invests in experiences, it's really in pursuit of possessions. And so he finds himself at the end of his days alone in a mansion filled with possessions, unhappy, ruminating on his, uh, his childhood. There's another picture for him. <laughs> okay, so what, does make you happy. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Positive psychologists do occasionally touch on this subject as well. Uh, and it, broadly speaking, there are two categories of sources of happiness. So uh, fleeting and enduring. And you know, both are important. It's important to know about both. So uh, fleeting sources of happiness are familiar to you. They're hedonic pleasures like <laughs> sex, food, back rubs, um, various combinations of the above. Um, <laughs> I, uh, and I just have to caution you, be very careful mixing these, be very careful. Um, uh, and enduring sources of happiness uh, tend to be more linked to meaning and life satisfaction. So that ice cream sundae, would, research suggests it will absolutely make you happy for a short period of time. Uh, and you should probably make some room in your life for some ice cream sundaes. Um, but we'd be interested in you know, what are more sustainable sources of happiness uh, as well? What are enduring sources of happiness? These are the kind of things, these, these sources overlap more with the sources of meaning and purpose in life. Uh, so what are some of those things? Okay, relationships. Be the, probably the number one thing that this literature talks about is that people who are more connected with higher quality, I mean, whatever that means exactly, more, you know, more fulfilling relationships with other people, they're embedded in dense social networks characterized by, by um, enduring intimate ties with other people, uh, they're much happier. And this could be the biggest thing that is in your control that would lead you towards happiness and, and, and purpose in life. Um, and when we at the end of this talk, kind of come back on, on meaning and purpose some more. Uh, you know, this, the same message will be echoed. Um, in addition, exercise, physical activity, fitness, uh, not as fun as an ice cream sundae, definitely not as fun as a back rub, uh, but uh, these are also sources of happiness because of the fundamentally physical nature of our brains. Um, and then an interesting one we maybe didn't, wouldn't think of is moderation, savoring things. One of my favorite recent positive psychology studies is this study of uh, people's appreciation of chocolates. So uh, they did this great study, I think, on chocolates where they uh, invited people into a lab and they videotaped them as they ate some really good artisanal chocolate, like the high quality top shelf stuff, and videotaped them and had people code how much they seemed to enjoy eating this chocolate. You know, these close up shots of their faces as they ate the chocolate. It's a really weird study, very, very strange study. Uh, and there were three conditions to this study, experimental conditions. In one, before this savoring episode, this videotaped coded savoring episode, uh, they had either been told, to abstain from eating chocolate for a week, or in another condition, they were not really given any instructions. And then in a third condition, they were encouraged to just gluttonously eat as much chocolate as possible. Um, and so in which condition do you think that they had the most enjoyment of the chocolate? The abstention condition, yes, exactly. So essentially this Lent-like ritual of abstaining from something that you maybe enjoy uh, helps you enjoy it more. Um, and more pictures of hippos, yeah. Uh, <laughs> enjoying things, <laughs> gluttonously. Um, other stuff that makes people happy. Uh, so when we look at this literature on positive psychology, uh, most of what it does is it goes up to old folklore about what's gonna make you happy, what's gonna lead you to a purposeful life, and sort of sorts out what's true and what's not. Wealth, no. 
uh, relationships, yes, and so on and so on. Uh, but does it tell us something we didn't know already, like something we wouldn't necessarily have come up with on our own? And in order to try to come up with new discoveries of things that make us happy, uh, positive psychologists developed a very interesting technology called the experience sampling method, where they would, through either phone applications or giving people beepers, beep them in the course of their everyday life and ask them, what are you doing right now? How happy are you? And try to get this kind of local emotional signature of the sources of happiness. And uh, one of the things they discovered in this research, this, uh, this great positive psychologist, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, very challenging name to pronounce, but that, that's how you pronounce it. Uh, Csikszentmihalyi discovered uh, that the state of flow is a major source of happiness for people. And what is flow? So flow is when you become completely immersed in some activity and it consumes your sort of consciousness. Uh, it challenges you, so it has to be a sort of taxing activity, one that you, know, that you can't just do really, really easily. It takes, you know, it's not like taking the garbage out. This has to be like challenging, like knitting or something like that. Something where it's like fills your whole consciousness. Um, but you're also, you're, you're pretty, you find you're pretty good at it. You're successful at it. If something is over challenging to you or you feel low expertise in the area, that, that does not produce a flow state and happiness. Um, and so here you might think of, you know, driving, like driving on a mountain road, you know, where you're banking on all these curves and it's fully consuming your attention. You gotta pay attention. It's kind of fun can't think about anything else, and you lose yourself in the activity, right? Uh, dancing, skiing, a great conversation, you know, with, with other people, these kinds of things can create a flow state. And so um, one of the things they would say uh, is that you should find what it is that, you know, for you creates a flow state and, uh, and do that, whatever that thing is, more. Please make yourself at home. Um, uh, so, so flow states, that's another way to get to happiness. Nice novel discovery, very interesting thing. I remember when I was a, a teenager and, and was obsessed with authenticity, I don't know why I'm talking so much about that. Um, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I was, you know, I was, had, had challenging times as a teenager as we all do and I, I think maybe the best time I had as a teenager was this one time when I just, you know, found myself alone in a gymnasium with a rack of basketballs, just shooting three pointers and went on this like terrific streak of made three pointers or I made like, you know, nine in a row or something like that. It was far and away the, the most successful basketball moment. No one was watching, but it didn't matter. I was just lost in the motions and I lost myself and it was successful. I was good at it and I was focusing and, and it was fantastic. Um, Okay, other stuff. Um, what else makes you happy? Uh, a lot of research suggests generosity makes you happy. Sort of the flip side of accumulating wealth is giving away resources to other people tends to make people happy. In fact, they've done these very interesting studies where they study you uh, spending money on yourself versus others and people uh, you know, are happier when they spend the same money on, on other people than if they spend it on themselves. It's interesting, interesting research uh, that we'll return to. Um, and then, this is a very interesting piece of research. You may have heard of this in the sort of popular press. Uh, gratitude, so uh, express, expressing gratitude in relationships, um, uh, taking moments to be grateful for things in your life. Uh, when you think about it, when you first kind of think about it, you may be like, oh, that's a very crunchy Northern California recommendation for how to find <laughs> happiness. And it is, that's true. <laughs> but it's also, it totally makes sense, right? Like being oriented towards the world in such a way where you're focused on what you have and what you have to be thankful for rather than what you don't have, what you're scrapping to get, what you want to have, what you maybe never can get but would like to have you know, it's, it's quite obvious the former orientation is gonna bring you more happiness and satisfaction. And they've done a lot of really interesting research on this where they'll have people do diary studies where they have to on a daily basis make note of things that they're grateful for or, uh, or not, or in a third condition, uh, things they don't have, which you can guess which one of these things makes you happier. But then think about like the average American's existence, you know, turning on TV and, and watching the Kardashians or Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous or watching advertisements you know, or flipping through brochures that come to you in the mail, which of the conditions of the experiment is it easier to find yourself in, you know, just as an American in the modern world? You know, whether you're trying to be grateful or not, the world is trying to tell you what you don't have. And so it really is kind of a challenge to keep that orientation towards what do I have that I should be grateful for, not take for granted. Um, and you can see why it would make you, make you happier. 
in, there's a lot of good relationship research as well that suggests that uh, romantic relationships and families benefit from this orientation towards gratitude. So like expressing gratitude or having gratitude rituals, like, uh, like when you sit down to dinner, you know, like uh, having everybody say something they're grateful for that day, be it a tiny thing or a big thing, can be a positive relationship building exercise. And also, you know, like, you know just a little bit reorient you in your view of the world. Um, and you know, this is again, this is an idea with deep roots in religious communities and the Thanksgiving rituals of America. You know, it's something we kind of know, uh, but it's hard to do it all the time, you know, because uh, it's, it's quite easy to slip into thinking about what you don't have. So that's kind of the sky high view on, well, that, those are, that's, that's a detailed view. Let's do a little bit of a, a, you know, a, a sky high, zoom out a little bit, try to take some main themes from this, because if I was you, I'd be like, okay, wait, what all am I, I've got like 15 things I'm supposed to not do or do. Let's try to condense that a little bit so you can take it with you. Uh, some themes, so first, it is the case that material security, physical health, that does provide for your happiness. I don't wanna tell some story where, you know, like, you know, income doesn't matter at all. It does. It's after 75,000 that it doesn't do much more. Um, but having your basic needs met, absolutely. Uh, that, that makes you happier. Uh, one of the themes you see in some of these things, you know, like the flow state, uh, relationships, generosity is self-transcendence. That's a theme I'm going to talk about a few times here. Uh, overcoming yourself, being less individualistically oriented, uh, that, that is one way towards happiness and meaning. Uh, appreciation, gratitude, gratefulness, focusing on what you have, not what you don't have. Uh, and relationships, investing in relationships, expressing gratitude in them, being generous to other people. This is a path. This is another path. Uh, benefiting others, you can kind of package that with relationships uh, and with self-transcendence. So you see, even within these, these sky-high themes, there's, you could even reduce this down maybe to a couple other things, you know, uh, being oriented towards what you have and being, and being oriented towards others, you know, and building those relationships with other people and not being too focused on yourself. That, I, that's a picture of the Dalai Lama. Um, but, but seriously, you know, like one of the things we see from this literature is that a lot of Buddhist themes emerge from it, uh, which is interesting. I don't think I, I anyway, expected that going in. Um, and uh, John Haidt, the author of the happiness hypothesis, uh, says that, you know, if you had to identify, like, you know, one set of scholars or one sort of spiritual tradition that's associated with the findings from positive psychology, it would be the Buddhist tradition, um, which, is, which is interesting. Um, okay, so that's research on happiness. Um, but what about meaning? Right? The title of the talk is about meaning. And uh, one of the things that we find is that research on the pursuit of meaning shows that the sources of a meaningful life, of a purposeful life, uh, they overlap with the sources of happiness, um, research suggests. But there's also some departures. You know, it is also a different thing that we need to study, somewhat unique from happiness. So what's, what's an example of one of these departures? So a classic example, maybe the number one example of where the things that make you have a meaningful life are different from the things that uh, lead you to happiness would be the experience of parenting. <laughs> so <laughs> it's not the most, yeah. This is, so we, we don't talk about parenting this way very much, but the experience sampling method, when people do these kind of in the cut of everyday life studies of parenting, the emotional signature of acts of parenting, the, like the local activities you have to do, looks almost identical to household chores which is a very interesting takeaway. Um, I apologize if you're, if you're here with your family, uh, <laughs> and this, this truth is faced collectively. So, so it is very hard, it's very hard. There's a lot of work that has to be done, you know, and you're often very tired. You are done with your work day, and you have to do more work, you know, like it, it's a lot of work. But uh, on the flip side, when you look at the sources of a meaningful life, of a purposeful life, Overwhelmingly, you see a lot of those things uh, are parenting or family, you know, more generally related uh, events and activities. So when you ask people, you know, what is the most meaningful moment of your life, you'll see things like uh, birth of a child, you know, um, child's, you know, first words or first steps, uh, seeing your child um, graduate from high school or college, um, uh, seeing your child get married, you know, get partnered up. Uh, in fact, it's kind of an interesting thing about it as, as alumni coming back here, uh, you know, that your experience graduating was meaningful for you or else you wouldn't be here. But, you know, if your uh, parents were fortunate enough to witness that, like that might have been the most meaningful moment of their lives, you know. And uh, there may be nothing that gets reported more on surveys of that uh, than, you know, seeing your kid graduate from, from some school or another. 
So, so that's interesting. So that tells us they're not the same thing. Some of the same things make you happy and have a meaningful life, and there's some, some departures. So for further insight on the pursuit of meaning, and in particular, how we can find meaning in an unjust world, um, we can turn to human behavior and social experience in really unjust situations. So let's, let's, go, let's go deep into the belly of the beast, to natural disasters. Uh, human and social caused. So uh, Kai Erickson is a sociologist, um, now emeritus, bless you, now emeritus at Yale University, uh, and he analyzed the Buffalo Creek flood that destroyed Logan County, West Virginia. And his research was based on in-depth interviews with uh, you know, members of this community, citizens of the uh, Logan County uh, area, and he found that the trauma that they experienced was as much, well, it was produced in part by the physical experience of the flood, uh, which destroyed homes, uh, destroyed lives. Over 100 people died in this terrible flood. Uh, but it was also caused by uh, the community that people lost. And in fact, when people would talk about like, what hurt them about the flood, what they lost in the flood uh, that destroyed you know, famously everything in its path, uh, they talked as much about their social relationships, the community they lost. Because these people sort of, you know, they, they didn't relocate to one area. They kind of went off and scattered, and then some of them came back and settled. But when they came back, they found something wasn't there anymore. And that was the thing that was connecting them, the things that tied them. Those ties and that sense of community um, you know, had, had vanished with the flood. And uh, there was a sense that the community was this sort of critical buffer against the pain that was associated with life's injustices, the flood included. And when they lost it, when that was knocked out, the collective trauma from the event was greater. Um, that if maybe if this disaster had had some, somehow a different character where it didn't destroy the relationships, people might have gotten along a lot better afterwards. So that's an interesting idea. This idea that if you had community, you might survive a traumatic event better than if you didn't. Um, so can we find an example of a natural disaster where some people had community to lean on uh, and other people didn't. And as it, as it turns out, there's been a lot of systematic study of exactly that uh, in post-Katrina New Orleans. Um, so Mary Waters at, uh, is a sociologist at Harvard who uh, has done some really interesting analysis of, of people in the New Orleans area and how they've endured this, this tragedy. And she finds a few takeaways. I'll just give you some, some bullet points here. So first, uh, there was a ton more community on display in post-Katrina New Orleans than you might have taken from media portrayals. You know, the media went for the most salacious, tough stuff, you know, like, you know, the, the fragmented uh, society of the Superdome, you know, in the, in the days after the disaster. Please grab a seat, make yourself at home. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, uh, you know, and that's true. There was this sense in which, for many parts of New Orleans, the social order was, you know, just torn apart. You know, absolutely. Um, but it's also the case that there were these kind of heroic feats of community that happened. Um, and they're like really specific stories. Because it turns out that New Orleans was characterized by amazing levels of uh, religious solidarity and also neighborhood solidarity. And so one example is uh, this parish, um, this Christian parish of Asian Americans who relocated to the Tennessee area just as a total unit. You know, like several hundred people just went as a group. Well, over 100 people went as a group. And they reported, you know, better mental and physical health outcomes than the average victim of Hurricane Katrina, in part because they, they stuck together. They, they just relocated their whole community. Um, and there's also these stories of people who didn't have the choice to relocate as a group or, or somehow weren't able to make it happen using the internet, using you know, message boards and email listservs to stay connected and, and reporting that that was critical to their survival of this experience. And then uh, there's also these, like, I mean, really kind of moving stories of you know, ministers driving from New Orleans to the Gulf Coast of Texas to maintain, you know, to do two sermons on Sunday, you know, one for the relocated people from their neighborhood and then, you know, one for the, the people that were still back there to try to keep them connected, you know, even though like, you know, dozens of miles separated them, they're trying to keep them together. And uh, so in this way, there was a lot more community than maybe, maybe we, we thought from the televised images. Second takeaway from Mary Waters' research. So 
So Katrina victims, uh, they relied on these communities when they had them, and that turned out to be one of the best predictors of their mental and physical health coming out of the event, um, was the extent to which they were able to stay connected to their religious and neighborhood-based communities. People who did, who, who found a way, or circumstances allowed it, or what have you, uh, they, they just, they did better. They had, they had less uh, trauma. Um, somewhat related to that, when they interview people in post-Katrina New Orleans about their experience of the flood, uh, one of the things they say, one of the biggest, most reliable predictors of um, you know, surviving this without, without major mental trauma is the extent to which they felt left behind. So the, so the people who really felt left behind, who felt abandoned, like the relief effort hadn't reached them, uh, that nobody had really helped them in their community or outside, like they really struggled worse than people who felt that they weren't left behind, that you know, people looked out for them, which is interesting and tells you something, I think. I mean, we could analyze this, and I don't think we know all the reasons why this is, but I think one reason is, you know, it's one thing to learn this lesson about the injustice the world is capable of when this terrible natural disaster happens to you, but like if you can still rely on a basic theory of humanity as good, that helps. You're like, okay, we've got people, you know, people will look out for each other in this world. But if you can, if both things are shattered, you know, that's really hard. That's a lot to take in. Third takeaway from Mary Waters' research, uh, there's this interesting finding of post-traumatic growth. Um, so my, my wife is a social worker and she, uh, she talks to me about this, about how one of the things social workers try to do is take people who have been through traumatic experiences and see if not only can you make people better, get them back to where they were, but wherever possible, maybe there is an opportunity for growth. You know, and maybe if you could encourage enough sort of emotional resilience, uh, you could get to some places that you weren't before. It's an interesting and provocative idea, and they have, you know, standard measures of post-traumatic growth, and they've administered them to survivors of uh, post-Katrina New Orleans. And, you know, one of the things they find is that uh, the people who were able to sustain community, sustain relationships, they experienced more of this post-traumatic growth. They were more likely to say that they developed new insights on their place in the world, uh, that they found out new things about their own personal strength and the strength of their community communities, uh, and they you know, were more likely to say that they gained perspective or appreciation of what they had, um, having seen just how bad it could have been. Uh, so this is a very interesting finding. I don't want to paint a picture of you know, Katrina as leaving you know, a majority of people that experienced post-traumatic growth, but it happened in some places that people say, in certain ways, I'm better off, or I got to a better place as an individual. And if you were trying to predict who those people were, understanding their social experience of the disaster would be where you would start. Okay, so, uh, so post-Katrina New Orleans, you know, we can predict which folks uh, did better um, by who stayed connected to other people, who received support from others, and who had the chance themselves to support other people. Um, which is interesting. So remember, generosity is one of the paths to happiness and is also a path to purpose and meaning in life. It's not just maintaining these relationships so they can help you, so they can support you. It's also so you can have an opportunity to help other people. Uh, and that's the sort of perhaps ironic, surprising takeaway from research on the pursuit of meaning is that when you uh, do acts of service for other people, you can, you can uh, benefit yourself um, in this kind of fundamental way. And so it's through mutual support, mutual dependence, uh, that, um, that people did something you might imagine would be impossible, which is finding some sort of growth experience in this disaster. Okay, so let's revisit some of the themes here. So uh, how are people finding you know, meaning? Right? One way is through generosity, being kind to other people. Uh, another way is through relationships, developing and maintaining these, these relationships. Uh, another is you know, humility, appreciation, self-transcendence. Um, also, connection to other people, maintaining the sort of web of connections, maintaining community, finding solidarity with other people, uh, and, uh, and then self-transcendence. Um, so let's return to our motivating question of you know, finding meaning in an unjust world. How do we do it? And I would say, uh, when we see that these factors can lead you to uh, a meaningful life, you start to see a way out of that tension, right? you start to see that uh, the tension doesn't seem so large. Perhaps ironically, research on the science uh, of meaning and happiness uh, and satisfaction suggests that you can find meaning by trying to make the world less unjust for other people. 
So by dedicating yourself to activities that would reduce injustice, reduce the extent to which the world is unjust, you might find meaning along the way. And so something that maybe seemed like a paradox is not such a paradox. It's not so much the case that there's this, this tension between uh, finding meaning for yourself and doing service for other people. Uh, instead, by doing service for other people, you can find meaning yourself. By orienting, orienting ourselves to others, uh, cultivating strong relationships, appreciating other people, being kind, fighting injustice, uh, we can find something, you know, find a better place for ourselves. So maybe that tension was the whole time an illusion and we need to turn to one another and invest in one another uh, and escape the self. Um, okay, uh, so you might think that we're, we're done, but we're not quite done, we're not quite done. Um, it's not quite the end. Um, so let me talk about just a couple other insights on the pursuit of meaning um, and a couple of kind of places we could find it. So one, there's a very interesting recent study that was done in the journal Psychological Science where they did a cross-national comparison of what nations citizens tend to find happiness. And one of the things that they find is that citizens of poorer nations actually tend to find uh, more uh, meaning in life. Not necessarily, they actually have, they're a little bit less happy, but they find more meaning. And they are, they're less satisfied and happy, more meaningful lives. And so they immediately jumped on this, like, why that, why that? heck would that be? Uh, and one of the things they find is that poorer nations tend to be more religious. And this isn't the only thing that explains this link, but it's one of the things. This partially accounts for this relationship between um, poorer, less developed nations having more meaning, their citizens reporting on average, more meaningful lives. So that's interesting. Second thing, I would be remiss for talking this long about the pursuit of meaning in life without talking about Viktor Frankl's uh, great piece, Man's Search for Meaning, which some of you may have read, and, and if you haven't, I think you'd really enjoy it. It's a terrific piece, a terrific uh, short book. Which, in which Frankel documents his time at Auschwitz and how it was that the pursuit of meaning, finding a basis for meaning, wound up helping people physically survive the Nazi Holocaust. And uh, Frankel tells us that those of us, that those people that surrounded him during the Holocaust in Auschwitz who survived were those people who were able to find some source of meaning or purpose for their lives. And for a lot of people, this was about family. For a lot of people, this was about a cause. There's this famous aphorism where he talks about being on this terrible march with all these men, and one of them shouts out, like, what if, you know, what if our wives could see us now? I hope they're doing better than us. You know, let's think of them. And then you know, they walk on, thinking of their wives you know, in, a, in a better place for, you know, for pulling up that familial connection and that memory that gave their lives meaning, but also doing better because they knew every other one was thinking of the same thing, and that connection uh, you know, buttress them and help them survive this like terrible trudge through the cold. Um, but another thing Frankel talks about again is faith. You know that faith helped keep get people through. So we might think that that means these pieces of research mean religion is the answer. You know, you want to find meaning in life. You want to find purpose in life. Religion's the answer. Uh, and that's not wrong. That's not wrong at all. Uh, that is for a lot of people exactly the answer. But um, what if you're secular? What if you're, you're not a religious person? Um, what, if, uh, what about us atheists and agnostics? Um, you know, how can we know what it is about religion that, that helps solve this problem for people, that provides meaning for people? How can, how can we you know, get on the bus too? And really when you break down the features of religion, you see a bunch of, of organized religion. You see it's almost like a list of paths to, to meaning in life. It's, it's really interesting actually. Um, and I think you get a deeper insight on the functions, the social functions of religion from doing that. Um, and so we look at what it is about religion uh, that overlaps with the factors that you know, lead to the realization of a meaningful life. You see a lot of the same themes we've been talking about in a secular sense up to now, right? Generosity, morality, service, also all this community stuff, right? Solidarity, collectivism, community, family, religions, all religions emphasize these things. But another thing that you see with religion that we haven't talked about at all from a secular perspective is immortality. That's another thing that religions offer, almost all religions, all religions I'm aware of, offer some form of immortality, you know, um, which brings with it freedom from, liberation from, you know, the fear of, of mortality, right? Uh, and that's something that we haven't talked about. Um, so, we've talked about how with religion or without, you can be generous, 
right? You can behave in a moral fashion. You can dedicate your, act, your life to acts of service towards other people. You can invest in your networks with others. You can lose yourself in groups. You can find solidarity and connect with others. We've talked about how you, know, you could do that in a religious form if you wanted, a spiritual form or a totally secular form. We haven't talked about how uh, maybe you could achieve immortality without religion. And so the, this last part of my talk, uh, We'll, we'll talk about that. So to tie in briefly with reunion, homecoming, um, one way that people find you can achieve a sort of immortality is to embed yourself in multi-generational social traditions uh, that connect you to communities, to lose yourself in enduring traditions that connect you across time. And, you know, this, this guy is definitely transcending the self. This is an example. Uh, <laughs> And so losing yourself in these sorts of social traditions and rituals, this is something that the, soci the great sociologist Durkheim would say is a sort of secular way to get to the same places that religion takes you to, a sense in which you've, you've overcome your individuality, embedded yourself in groups, and become something or uh, uh, in a way minimize the self and embedded yourself in something bigger uh, than, than just you. And, and maybe you already knew that. And, uh, and maybe that's why you're here. But another way to think about a secular path to immortality is to maybe view the world the way people like me do, social scientists. Uh, so we social scientists tend to view people as essentially the products of their social influences. Uh, so to a sociologist, you are a collection of all the people who made you. Uh, so you are a collection of the lessons that were taught to you by people uh, that you interacted with, gifts that you received, uh, opportunities that were extended to you by people that you interacted with, uh, you know, your teachers who taught you how to think, uh, your um, heroes who taught you who you wanted to be, your uh, friends who taught you how to heal, and your parents who taught you how to feel. And uh, maybe if you think about it, they're the same thing. They are themselves many societies as well. All these people that brought you these gifts and these lessons that made you the things that you are, uh, the socially constructed person, those all came from people who were themselves socially constructed, that made up their personalities and their life paths from these social opportunities and this interdependence. Um, so every one of these people was themselves made up of all their social influences and all the gifts that they received. But this interconnectedness that precedes you across generations. It doesn't end with you. Instead, you take part in sending it on to new generations as well, right? So you, in turn, send your gifts on to new people. Uh, you teach people lessons. You offer your support to individuals and communities. You can be somebody's hero, same as someone was your hero. And some of what you pass on is what you received, and some of it's uh, new stuff that you make, all your own. And with this uh, position and this sort of interconnectedness, you can achieve a sort of immortality. Um, and in this way, you know, our fathers and our mothers, they never die because they live on in us. And, uh, and their fathers and their mothers, they don't die either um, because we can make them live by extending their lives forward in the gifts and the lessons that we extend to people in turn. And if we think of it this way, then we might not die either. Uh, because maybe the way we should see it, maybe the accurate, scientifically accurate way to see ourselves is not as separated people uh, milling about the world before we shuffle off. But instead, uh, we can imagine ourselves, and here, go with me on this, uh, please. Uh, you can imagine ourselves as a spot on a sort of giant wave <laughs> that moves through time together with others made of the same stuff as them, a part of this kind of great sea, a part of a great, greater collectivity. Uh, and if we can think this way, self-transcendence, relationships, generosity, uh, that the actual fundamental aspects of, a, of an accurate view of the social world, this is how us social scientists think about it, and maybe it's the way you could think about it too. Um, and so these things that connect us to other people before us and after, after us, they're the the firmament of that wave that we're all in. And if we can stop fighting it and just lose ourselves in the collective, letting go to connect, to serve, uh, to support others, to help others, uh, then we'll find love and connection, and we just might find purpose for ourselves along the way as well. So uh, these are the ideas that I want to talk with you guys about today, and uh, I look forward to your questions. Thank you.
For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.